Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown. I don't know why I have to keep on saying it twice, but I, I heard from my marketing professor, you say things enough, people will remember it. So I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I, I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on today. And she is the leader of the Communist Party of Alberta, Naomi Rankin. Naomi, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Oh, well, my pleasure. Uh, so Naomi, anyone who's listened to my show before knows my very first question out of the bat for any politician or any candidate for politics, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, I don't know. I don't think anyone could seriously answer that question. I mean, you know, I could tell you my, my family history and I'm a, I'm a third generation Marxist Leninist. So I learned about, you know, being a communist, you know, growing up, it wasn't some people have to go through you know real uh, difficulties and struggles like you know spiritual philosophical and moral struggles to to get to you know uh, to embrace the ideas of communism it was easy for me so in a sense i i don't i don't consider myself particularly typical in that and so i don't know that my <laughs> personal history then gets you know throws much light on that kind of question so I guess then the, the follow-up question to that is then, what does communism mean to you and what does being a communist mean? Well, communism in a nutshell is the concept of a society where the, 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 the slogan is from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. That is, we get beyond this, this stage of histories where there's no longer money, there's no longer uh, scarcity, there's no longer uh, national differences or antagonisms, it, you know, there's no longer exploitation or prejudice or oppression. And it's ob obviously, you know, I consider that to be a morally superior form of society, but it's, it's really becoming a question of great practical significance, be, given the, the the environmental climate change crisis, the pandemic crisis that we're currently involved in, it's become a matter of real importance that we make some, some pretty vigorous forward steps. Yeah. We're gonna talk about some of the pressing issues later on in the episode, but I wanna stick with you and who you are because I want my listeners to know who Naomi is because we are in the sort of, and I, I kind of heard this from a, a political pundit on my show last week, uh, is we are in the red zone of the election. We are just over a year away from the next provincial election here in Alberta. And while you are the longest serving provincial leader here in the province of Alberta, people might not know who you are. So I want you to take a few moments and explain to my listeners and my viewers who is Naomi and who is the Communist Party of Alberta and why are they so relevant today? Yeah. Well, I think we're relevant today because you know we put forward policies that are in the interests of working people. And that you know we will stick by those, you know, it's clear in our minds, we're consistent about it, and we fight for them. We don't wait for elections. The day after the election, we start back on the job of you know. Con continuing to be involved in democratic organizations and looking for allies and alliances to press our program of you know, better social services, more envi environmental protection, full employment, you know, all, a whole bunch of things like that, that you know, those are the things that we fight for year in, year out. Those are the things that people need. And so that's our job. Uh, so elections are, elections are important. I mean, it's who the government is, is not irrelevant, but elections to us are not the be all and end all. We, we consider that our political job is more profound, more far reaching than just uh, elections or running in elections, because we don't see any real you know, significant forward progress until really the working people decide that they're gonna step up and take charge. And why is it important for uh, the Communist Party of Alberta to still exist today? Uh, some people might say that we, we have that, but why is it so important to advocate for what you've just mentioned about workers' rights in today's society? Well, because we're very far from a society in which workers really do have rights. Okay. I mean, especially under the, under the existing government. I mean, the, the current, you know, the Kenny regime is, it's, 
it, if it had been invented by a, a you know, comic book uh, writer to, to exemplify all things backward and evil and cruel, <laughs> you, you'd come up with, with Jason Kenney. Right? Um, you know, so they, I mean, th this current government is really, it's, it's, you know, it's attempting to enact uh, rollbacks on all kinds of social services. And it's also, uh, you know, really attacking uh, workers' rights, like union rights. It's enacted, you know, bills to, to attempt to, to criminalize dissent, particularly in the area of environmental protection. And given that Alberta's economy is so, you know, still, um, skewed towards the oil and gas industry, it's of real importance that there's a real, people really understand how much of a change we need in our economy if it's not going to simply collapse. The rest of the world is not going to wait for Alberta to get on board. The rest of the world is gonna say, you know, we can't afford to burn stuff anymore. We're going to use solar, we're gonna use wind, we're gonna use, you know, there's all kinds of other technologies. We could, we could, you know, have really strong government policies to attempt to put Alberta at the forefront of changes in technology. Or we could have the, we could have a government that's, you know, that pours billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars into subsidizing, holding us back, pulling us back to obsolete technologies that are on their way down. So, you know, it, it's the, the rights of ordinary working people to speak up for a really different way of doing things is more important now than at any time in history. You, I, let, let's talk about Jason Kenney here for a second, because <laughs> I feel like you can't have a discussion about politics in Alberta without bringing Jason Kenney into it in the first 20 minutes of the show. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> he throws the around the world of uh, the word communism like it's a bad thing. He uses the word communism as it is a bad thing. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I am saying that's how he uses it. I want to know from you, why is why is the word such a why why does the word have such a negative connotation and how do you how do you fight back on that narrative because you seem like a nice person we we've had a quick <laughs> chat here so far you don't seem like a angry person who wants to destroy the world you just have your own beliefs so why do you think communism is such a bad word and how do you fight back on that sort of push that jason kenny does against that word well it's not just Jason Kennedy, Kenny. He's just he, you know, he exemplifies it. Yeah. But this is something that we've been, that we fought, we've been fighting for a hundred years. I mean, since the, you know, the formation of the Communist Party of Canada. It's because communism is actually a real threat to the to the privileged, to the wealthy, to the exploiters and oppressors, you know, to that, you know, as in the modern world, it's a smaller and smaller minority that owns more and more of the world's wealth and dictates more and more of the world's you know, future. Communism is, you know, as an actually progressive, socially responsible and democratic movement, it's a threat to those, you know, to those positions of privilege. So obviously they're going to be opposed to it. And obviously they're going to use all the resources at their command to engage in propaganda against it. And the more clear it is, um, you know, the, economic developments and social developments, you know, that communism, socialism is good for working people and socialism is the way forward out of our current problems and our current crises. The more it becomes obvious from real world events, the more hysterical their propaganda becomes. So communist, pro anti-communist propaganda has always been hysterical. It's always been based on ludicrous um, made up stories. Um, it continues to be so. So actually, somebody like Jason Kennedy, who's got a you know tenuous grasp on reality, is is going to be you know really good at that kind of thing. I mean, he's good at making up stories and you know imagining enemies and so on. But as I say, it's not just Jason Kennedy. It, it, Kenny, it's not just a, a personality flaw on his part. It's a necessary part of the whole uh, social structure of capitalism that it has to defend itself against the social system which is inevitably going to come after it so in the same way that feudal lords were you know were very much opposed to the idea of republicanism and democracy 
Well, capitalist lords are very much opposed to the ideas of socialism and communism. We are uh, in 2022. We are in the midst of a pandemic, a global pandemic around the world. Uh, we are seeing uh, the rise of governments across uh, Latin America and even uh, in uh, Eastern uh, culture of communism. And I, I'm just pointing to Chile right now because the ch new Chil Chilean president has, is coming in and he had has ties to the Chilean Communist Party, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. But how would the Communist Party of Alberta make Alberta better, in your words? How would they be able to fight for workers' rights if you were in the legislature? Because I, I'm just putting this out here right now. Alberta is a province in a country. And if you have, a, you, have, you have the Canadian government who tries to dictate a lot of things right now, so I'm assuming they would probably come after you. So how do you fight for workers' rights as a province instead of as a whole country? Well, obviously that does complicate the, the, the picture. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, we don't expect this to happen in, in uh, a vacuum, right? Like the, if there's an upsurge of the working class movement in Alberta, it's quite likely that there will be a, around the, the rest of the country as well. Frankly, Alberta, because it's not a, a highly industrialized province, it's not, a, it's not an accident that in some ways it has lagged behind other provinces sort of socially and politically in terms of attitudes. So we expect that by the time we're, you know, we're in a position to share power in Alberta, this, you know, that, that there will be similar movements across the whole country. It won't be in isolation. Do you see people coming to the party now? Oh yes, yeah. There's a, there's a significant increase in the number of people who are interested in joining our party. And how do you translate that into votes? Because that's that's the big thing, right? Because people interested in parties and people voting for parties are two different things. Because I can be interested in X, Y, and Z party doesn't mean that I'm going to vote for them. So how do you engage with people in this pandemic, but also engage with them and keep them in the fold? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the pandemic certainly makes things more difficult, but it doesn't fundamentally change the fact that you know, socialism is based on the, you know, the, the working class being the ruling class. The working people have to step up, that they're going to take control, that they're going to be in charge. This requires a, a quite a bit higher level of uh, political involvement and political um, development and education and sophistication. Uh, it doesn't mean voting once every four years. So, and even you know, even if we are elected, even if we were elected with a majority so that, you know, we just had the government, we would not actually be able to restructure the whole of, of society without the active involvement of the people that we want to see in charge, the work, the ordinary working people. And we wouldn't be able to withstand the, the machinations and, and the sabotage by the capitalist class either without the, the involvement, you know, the, you know, really strong uh, support and involvement of working people. So that's what we have to work at. We have to work at building up mass movements, democratic movements, alliances between movements, so that all the different social groups can get to be on the same page for an, for an overall program. The, the trade union movement, you know, primarily at the center of it, because that's, you know, by definition, that's workers, but also the women's movement, the environmental movement, Indigenous peoples struggling for their, you know, indigenous self-government and their rights. Uh, all, all, you know, all kinds of different uh, movements and different social issues coming together around a program that they can all mutually support. So that's our job: is to build up that movement, and then that movement has to play its role, uh, whether they, whether it has a friendly government in the legislature or an antagonistic government in the legislature. That movement and uh, consistently you know, being involved and active and pressing for its program and having an overall program, you know, bringing all those disparate strands together. That's what's going to determine the outcome, not just of an election, but the outcome of all the, the government actions in between elections. So what does that movement look like? What does that movement and what does that coalition look like? Because 
We are a more divided country than we have ever been in my lifetime. And I, I've never seen more vitriol and hate and anger via social media in the public. We are seeing a convoy of truckers go to Parliament Hill. There's been comments about potentially being January, the January 6th of uh, Canadian politics. How do we how do we start a movement when we are more divided than we have ever been in our lives? And how can you, as the leader of the Communist Party of Alberta, help form that movement to potentially make this a better country, a better, better province, and a better place that we can raise our families in? Well, I don't want to downplay that, you know, that those divisions and those antagonisms. I mean, it's a serious problem. It worries us. Yeah, we do not like we do not like to see the rise of these sort of far right wing movements and this sort of abrasive and violent kind of ideologies and you know, but what we have to offer we think is a positive program. I mean, we want full employment. We want you know a, a, a thirty two hour hour work week with no loss and take home pay. We want education, free education. We want better health care. We want you know, better environmental protections, we want true equality, we want more democratic involvement. It's our basic job is to put forward that positive program, and people will rally around a positive program. And I think really the, the underlying the source of those, you know, those really nasty and antagonistic, those angry, reactionary voices, it's Essentially, I think that's, you know, capitalist governments reaping what they sowed. I mean, they created a situation of greater and greater inequality and greater and greater insecurity. And people are frightened. I don't blame people for feeling frightened. You know, I don't blame those truckers for being alarmed. What's, you know, are they going to be able to make a living? The, the problem is when people have been lied to and lied to and lied to, as they have, by the capitalist system and, and the governments that serve it, it's really hard to figure out like who's lying, who's telling the truth, who can you trust? So this problem of not being able to trust the mainstream political leaders, it only increases the problem of people then being even more frightened and more worried and more uh, afraid to trust anybody. So then they stop trusting doctors you know, and medical uh, recommendations and advice. And they stop trusting the teachers. They think they're not telling them the truth. They stop this. It's a situation of extreme distrust. And of course, the problem is that a lot of that mistrust is justified. They have been lied to. They have been misled and they have been betrayed. I mean, they voted for uh, political programs that were put forward during election campaigns and then they got just the opposite when the liberals or the conservatives or whatever got into power. So, and this has happened over and over and over. So it's not, it's not a simple problem, but it, the answer is still the same, like putting forward a positive program that people can rally around and fight for themselves, get involved in themselves, something positive to work on, some sense that they have the potential to have power, that they're not just helpless and hopeless. I think that's the best thing that we can do to, in the long run, overcome those, you know, the, those very um, violent, reactionary sort of conspiracy theory kind of ideas. It won't happen fast. It, it's still going to be, a, you know, a period of pretty intense struggle and antagonism to get through that. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Do you have hope that we can get through it sooner rather than later? Because I think a lot of Canadians and a lot of Albertans are sitting around their dinner table right now or listening to this or listening to it later on and thinking to themselves that it's hard. 
like you said, inequality is getting worse. We saw the richer get richer during the pandemic. We saw the low income potentially become even low. And we have people losing jobs left, right, and center because of the pandemic, because of oil prices. People need hope. So how do we give them hope when even you just admit it, it's not a light switch uh, solution where we can just flick a switch and everything's going to be kumbaya. How do you give them hope to say a better future is tomorrow? We just have to work towards it and people just need it now. Well, if I had the, a real simple answer to that, <laughs> I'd have done it already, you know, yeah. and we'd be there already. I mean, it is, it is complicated. It is yeah. difficult. Yeah. But that's what we're fighting for, a positive program that meets people's needs, that people can have hope for. But, well, I can, you know, just like give you an anecdote, like from way, way back in the 80s, there was a, there was a really big worldwide upsurge of the peace movement because there had also been finally a real upsurge of anxiety about the dangers of nuclear war. This anxiety spilled into everything, seeped into everything. You couldn't have a, you couldn't have a casual conversation about anything anywhere in the world where it wouldn't just happen to come up if we're still alive. Like this feeling of impending doom was, you know, was really everywhere. People were genuinely frightened. There was, and children were frightened. Children, you know, young children were, they didn't necessarily, you know, they weren't necessarily told about it in so many words, but they picked up on this. You know, they overheard this, they were frightened. The children who, the, the, the set of children who were less frightened were the children of peace activists when they saw their parents actually involved in demonstrations and organizing and protesting and so on, this didn't mean that their parents actually were in positions of power. They were protesting, they were in, you know, they were in a defensive position, but they saw their parents doing something and they saw that their parents saw a way out and those children were less afraid. Um, so I think, you know, there's a parallel here, you know, with the, you know, the, the anxiety, not just the children, but the adults the anxiety, the fear, the insecurity, the people who in, get involved in active campaigning for, you know, whether it's for employment or safety or uh, improved medical services or increased funding for, you know, education or healthcare or better housing or higher minimum wage, whatever it is they're fighting for, you know, for peace that st is still an issue to fight against war, to fight to lower the, the military spending and so on. The people who are involved in those activities are the ones who feel stronger, who feel empowered, who feel more optimistic. So essentially, I think it, you know, it can become a sort of um, a virtuous circle where the more people do it, the more people see that other people are doing it, the more they realize that this, you know, life is not hopeless. There is a way forward. This is the way, you know, um, you know, um, this is a really democratic way of, of moving forward that we are going to, you know, collectively struggle for, campaign for, you know, solutions to problems. We're not going to just sit back and wait for the, the wealthy and the powerful to somehow, you know, become nicer. <laughs> Um, let, let's talk about the campaign for part of that statement that you just made there. Like I said, we are in the red zone, kind of the year out from the next general election. May 2023 is when we, the writ is expected to drop. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty on where the province is going because of COVID-19. And I want to start there with COVID-19. How, uh, how do you, as the leader of the Communist Party of Alberta, feel that, how do you feel Jason Kenney has handled the pandemic so far? Uh, well, couldn't, couldn't very well be worse. <laughs> well, I, I suppose it could be worse. You know, there's, there's the 100% denial position where people pretend that there isn't such a disease. But, um, you know, because uh, Jason Kennedy's like the ideology, ideological position he was already in before this pandemic began was a kind of science denying position, uh, you know, an all power to the powerful position, uh, you know, a, a real disdain for uh, democracy, a real disdain for social um, solidarity. So the, the pandemic has, the pandemic has really made everybody 
just be like themselves only more so. You know, that, um, you know, when there, he, this was, it, I mean, it's a terrible thing, you know, there's uh, disease and death, you know, and fear, but it could have been, it could have been a way forward too, right? It could have been op an opening to, well, a guaranteed, you know, livable income. It could have been a way forward to, uh, you know, a reason to stop subsidizing the oil and gas industry and start pouring money into other things. It could have been an, it could have been like a, a pause that, that 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 pause in the economy could have been an opportunity to move into a totally new direction. But instead, a they doubled down on increasing subsidies to oil and gas, in, in you know pouring and pouring the federal subsidies that, that, you know, that they could get available into simply subsidizing the wealthy instead of, you know, the poor. They, but also they've, you know, with their ideology of, oh, business is everything, they downplayed the need for health measures. They were always opening up sooner than they should have, opening up more than they should have. If, if the whole world had gone into a real, you know, severe lockdown for a month in January of 2019, sorry, uh, so January of 2020, you know, that would have been it. You know, I mean, COVID would have disappeared. Of course, of course that, that's, you know, that couldn't have happened. I mean, in the modern world, it's just too complex. You couldn't have had a simultaneous worldwide lockdown of a month. But the more, the places, the countries which engaged in a more vigorous lockdowns, along with the, with the necessary social supports, you know, like, so income supports and, you know, uh, ensuring like food deliveries and so on. Those are the places that, that did better, you know, that wrestled the, the pandemic uh, to the ground sooner. And Alberta is, was one of the worst at these, you know, in terms of delaying any kind of public health response making it a half-hearted response, but most of all, failing to provide this, the financial and the social supports to help people through that period of, uh, of lockdown, you know, to therefore making it, you know, as difficult as possible for ordinary working people. So obviously this is gonna give rise to, the, to the, the, the biggest possible resistance. You know, people don't just, you know, disagree with the, I, with the very fact that there is a pandemic. People aren't just anti-vax or anti-mask out of nowhere. Again, it comes, you know, as I was talking about before, they've been lied to and lied to and lied to. And by this same government, so why, why would, should they believe that the government's telling the truth now when it's putting them to so much, not just inconvenience, but hardship? So, well, I personally actually do believe that there really is a virus. I, I personally believe that the vaccines are genuinely as effective, you know, percentage-wise as, as the public health officials are saying. And I, you know, do believe that masks are going to help, you know, prevent the spread. So I'm not, you know, I'm not supporting those ideas at all, but I see where they're coming from. They come from the, the weakness and ineffectiveness of the government and public health response. So it, it provides a breeding ground. The lack of, of effective response provides a breeding ground for, ground for the virus. It also provides a breeding ground for crackpot ideas about the virus. So I, I, I got to follow up with that because anyone who's listening to this knows that every leader of any political party has been asked this question, but I'm going to ask you this because I'm not sure if you've been asked this because I've, I've tried to do my research on you and I'm just going to ask it anyway. Have you been vaccinated? Yes. Two times, three times, booster shot? Yeah, I've had the booster shot. Yeah. Do you believe in mandatory vaccinations for people in uh, positions of power, AKA teachers, uh, healthcare workers, or do you think it's a freedom of choice, personal responsibility? I certainly support you know, mandatory vaccination for people in, in healthcare, any kind of healthcare situation. Um, for all the others, I think it's, you know, there are sort of, there are, kind of fair degrees of, of mandatoriness, like working outward from the most critically, you know, important people who work most with the public. So, but also, you know, like we, we have to look at the other side too, like make sure that it's actually available to everybody when they need it. 
So, I mean, there are two sets of people that I know of who are really dissatisfied. The ones who, who feel like they're being forced to take a vaccination when they don't want it. But there's others who've been like holding their breath, waiting for their turn, right? Like the lack of, of availability of the vaccine has also been a problem. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is, this is not just a, a force of nature. This, this arises out of the, the structural uh, disintegration of the of um, the Canadian um, pharmaceutical industry that was created, like the, the in, in the Mulroney government, de, you know, sold off a publicly owned pharmaceutical sector. the The capacity of in in Canada for us to make our own vaccines was deliberately destroyed. Now that happened be, well before the this pandemic came on, but surely they knew, you know that. <laughs> diseases develop over time. I mean, all possible, all scientists, all researchers, all medical people could have told them that there, there will be another pandemic sometime in the future. Right? It's, Everybody not, it's not how long it's going to be, when is it going to happen? Yeah. And I mean, let's, we, let's, you know, go ahead. there is already, you know, we already had ample evidence just from the flu, like every year they have to second guess and try to figure out what flu vaccine to use because the very you know variants of the flu are always mutating and always changing, so it's it, you know the, the overwhelming evidence that we're going to need these resources in the future. We we live in one of the most uh, uh, how do I how do I say this correctly here? We live in Alberta, which is known around Canada as the energy capital of Canada. We uh -huh. export uh, crude oil, we export bitumen, uh, we try to with pipelines. What is your position on the energy industry as it stands today? And if elected to government in 2023, or if, if you have, when you put out your platform, what will the energy policy be for the province of Alberta? Because we have a large population in the province who rely on the energy industry who work for the energy industry. And some might think if you get elected, you're going to cut it, cut the energy industry, and you're going to put a lot of people out of jobs. How do you balance the need for employment with the need for the environmental responsible government that you want to try and put forward? Okay. Well, first of all, the first point in our program is full employment. Yep. We're not compromising on that. Anybody who loses a job in one place, Will be guaranteed a job in another place and they'll be guaranteed um you know that their income level will be sustained if there if there's a necessary period of retraining for a new a new form of employment so that's the first thing is that workers are not the ones who should be paying the price and making the sacrifices for the big changes that have, have to come full employment but full employment in a context where you can't sell it if people don't want to buy it. Oil and gas is, is, you know, is the industry of the past, and there's no point in pouring any more development into the past. Let's invest in the future instead of the past. So we need to develop other forms of energy. And in fact, Alberta is also you know, amazingly blessed with the resources for other forms of energy, for the, re for the renewable ones. Like, you know, we have wind, we have sun. <laughs> There's even like, you know, possibility of geothermal and something, you know, there's many other forms of energy that we could be developing. And we have a, you know, a well-educated uh, workforce. We have, we could be at the forefront in the world of new, of research and development of new technologies. You know, we've had governments that have held us back. They've pulled us back from that and put us at the rear of um, new development. Well, the economies that do well in the world are the economies that are the innovators, you know, the ones who are most um, involved in new technologies, new research and development. We could be that, we could still be that. We don't have to be the dinosaurs of the world economy. You, you made mention earlier about 1980s and the nuclear movement and uh, peace, uh, peace activists around the nuclear movement. Jason Kenney has recently, along with Premier Scott Moe of Saskatchewan and Premier Blaine Higgs of uh, New Brunswick, announced an MOU around small nuclear reactors for the province of Alberta. 
meaning that they would want to try to diversify the energy industry and start creating nuclear energy here in the province of Alberta. What is your position on the nuclear industry and where do you stand on the small nuclear reactors that they're talking about? Well, I'm going to say here that I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but one, one of the things that I think that it's going to be very important for a new government that really puts the interests of working people first is ask the engineers. Like one of the, you know, one of the groups which is going to get the most benefit from a socialist government is going to be the engineers because we're going to free them from being tied to the profit motives of the currently existing corporations in oil and gas. So that we're going to actually ask their real opinions. What? That's it's, it's such gonna, a weird idea that asking people yeah, for their ideas. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to throw lots of money at giving them, you know, research projects. If that, so that if they don't know the answer, they can go out there and find it. Right. So I actually don't know. I mean, in some ways, it's it's a technical question, right? Like. I'm skeptical because nuclear has, you know, nuclear carries its its uh, you know difficulties, and you know primarily, like what do you do with the spent fuels? I mean, that's a quarter of a million year problem, not a you know to a single problem. election yeah. cycle problem. So, so you know, I I want some some real answers where the engineers, the scientists, and the engineers are freed from, you know, the constraints of of corporate jobs so that they can tell us their real opinions on this. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You, uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put a lot of eggs into that basket. <laughs> no, understandable. I want to turn to a, a subject that got a lot of news in early 2000s, early, late 19, 2019, early 2020, uh, late 2019, and that is Indigenous rights. Mm -hmm. We... Just recently, as of recording this, I think yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, uh, another 39 bodies of kids, Indigenous children, were discovered at a residential school in Williams Lake, BC. We have a black mark on our on the Canadians' history. How does the how does your party and how do you view reconciliation? and partnering with our First Nations and Métis communities around Alberta. Okay, reconciliation, you know, comes after truth. The first thing is, you know, we do, we have to acknowledge the, that reality, but we have to acknowledge that reality, not just in the past, but in the present. What's going on now? You know, what's still happening which is you know, colonial and, and oppressive and culturally genocidal and even you know, like physically you know, results in, in death and, and suffering for people. And the, the, um, you know, the conditions of, of poverty and substandard housing and, and the lack of financing for education for indigenous students and so on. You know, there's all kinds of conditions that are still continuing to deliberately maintain that, you know, that inequality, deliberately marginalize Indigenous people. So first of all, we have to recognize that that really is still happening, that we, that we owe <laughs> the Indigenous people at least, at the very least, the same level of funding of uh, housing, social services, education, as the, you know, the population in general. And we also we owe some reparations because you know the this long history of the destruction of, of resources and the polluting and the you know the the 
the destruction of, of the possibility of a, of a viable economy for Indigenous people on their own lands because of the, you know, one-sided kind of economic development and, you know, pipelines being shoved through and, uh, you know, fishing rights and, and hunting rights becoming meaningless because they've killed the fish and they've, you know, poisoned the, the lakes and the, and the forests and so on. You know, all these things, we, you know, we owe reparations for, for past damages. But most importantly, is that we need to negotiate a new, you know, relationship amongst nations within Canada. I mean, Canada is not just one nation. Canada is made up of multiple nations. I mean, Quebec, of course, is the biggest sort of, you know, minority group is, is a nation in and of itself. Um, but also the, you know, there are all, all kinds of different indigenous communities. Different, you know, they have different histories and different structures. So it won't be a one size fits all kind of solution, you know, to, that would be just as much of a colonial imposition if we just said, this is how you're going to operate in future. This is how we're going to interact. It, you know, we really do need to have um, a negotiation amongst equals, amongst the nations of Canada for a new, a new uh, method of interacting. But the, the basic principle that, uh, you know, Indigenous communities are entitled to a land base their, their own lands, it's self-government within their lands, and to uh, uh, equality of the, uh, in the distribution of resources, both social services and investment for you know, future development. Um, the, the, you know, that basic principle has to hold for whatever kind of you know, um, special cases there are for each indigenous community. We have, uh, I, I don't know the exact number here, and please, uh, I apologize for anyone who's listening if I get this uh, wrong, but we have a diverse First Nations community in the province of Alberta. We have uh, First Nations communities up in the north, First Nations in the south, east, west, and even the center. I need you. To, I need you to talk to me as I'm a, a two-year-old here, Naomi, and I'm going to ask this question inappropriately. I'm going to ask this: How have you? How have you as the leader, but also you as the person I'm speaking to right now, helped with that truth and reconciliation process? Because we all have to look internally at ourselves to figure out how we can do better. And I, I, I need to know from our leaders, and I've asked, I'm going to ask this to every leader that sits down with me be between now and the election. How have you specifically helped in that practice of truth and reconciliation to make sure that we do not forget the past, but we also acknowledge the past. Well, I don't know that I want to answer that question because I'm going to say that I still think we, this is a political question. It isn't just a personal question. I mean, obviously the, you know, the culture, our whole culture has to change. Like the marginalization of indigenous people has to come to an end. You know, the recognition and respect of, of, of the, culture, the diversity of cultures and the diversity of nations and the diversity of communities, you know, there has to be a, a change in terms of attitude. But the really fundamentally important part of that is the political part, that, you know, a change of funding, a change of, of um, treaties, a change of uh, deals that are made between groups. So, whether yeah, I, I oh, whether I personally, you know, whether I personally go out and do something as a person isn't really the point. Is what do, where where do the parties stand on this? And on this one, I think from the point of view of the of the Communist Party of Canada, that's one of the things that I am most proud of in our hundred years. The the language we've used, you know, has changed. I mean, we we weren't we didn't magically know in 1922. That in in 2022 the proper word would be indigenous, not Indian, right? But from the very beginning, the, the Communist Party has recognized the the um, reality of colonialism, has re recognized the rights of nations, and that our our party has been the one that has shown the way for uh, 
your policies of, about what should be the proper relationship amongst nations, nation to nation relationships within Canada and actually, you know, worldwide. So. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. One of the big topics that uh, is uh, in front of a lot of parents right now is the education of their children. The current Kenny government, uh, along with the uh, Minister of Education, Lagrange, have put forward a K-6 to draft curriculum. Um, I, I need to know your thoughts on it, and what are you hearing from parents about this proposed draft curriculum? And how can we make it better? Because we always want to try to update our curriculums. And how can we do that to make sure that we are teaching our kids correctly, but also teaching them the information that they need to be prepared for uh, the real world? Yeah, well, again, it's if somebody was creating a comic book villain, <laughs> they couldn't do better than to just draw Jason Kennedy as a really so Jason Kenny, as he really is, I mean, this, I, I can't believe it. It's just a caricature of, of all things, uh, you know, unbelievably stupid to do with an education system. I mean, there was, for one thing, there was already a, 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 a modernization of the curriculum was, had been undertaken and, and was underway, you know, and a lot of work had been put in by uh, people like experts, you know, like experienced teachers and curriculum developers and people whose area of study and research is child development and so on. And so what, you know, what the Kenny government did was like they kind of threw all that out and they brought in their own committee, which essentially consisted of funda religious fundamentalists. I mean, they haven't said that in so many words, but I'm going to say it in so many words. This is part of the, this is part of an ideological offensive to try to get the most uneducated and backward form of religion as a substitute for a modern secular education system. They're just trying to bring in, you know, a, a whole bunch of backward, uh, I won't even call them backward ideas, but a backward attempt to suppress ideas and a backward attempt to prevent the development of um, critical thinking and knowledge of the world. There's no dinosaurs in their curriculum. How can there not be dinosaurs in the in the curriculum for K to six? It's it's, it's interesting. I I will admit to that. I uh, <laughs> I, I shake my head the sometimes. Answers because the dinosaurs are all in the legislature. That's why. <laughs> There's the poll quote. If I've ever had to do a poll quote of an episode. Um, I, I am just cautious of time here because we've just hit the 40 minute mark and I do want to start with a sort of looking at the future now. We've talked about policy. Now let's look towards the future. Um, we are, um, like I said, a, almost a year away until the next election. What does what do you and what does the Communist Party of Alberta and Canada need to do between now and the next election to be prepared for that election call? Well, Again, as I said before, we go on doing what we what we always do. We try to develop those uh, those mass movements and the alliances amongst mass movements, and the you know the the acceptance of a program that all of those different movements can get behind. Uh, you know, for social services, education, healthcare, uh, economic development, full employment, etc. Because I'm not going to pretend, right? As, as things stand right now, there, you know, there's not gonna be a, uh, there's not gonna be a communist party Alberta government after the next election. We probably aren't gonna run more than, you know, three or four uh, candidates in the whole province. The way in which we have an effect on the outcome of the election is that work that we're gonna do before the election is called. If, if, if a broad alliance 
embracing that kind of uh, program exists. And if the people are strongly enough uh, motivated and you know, committed to that program, then they're gonna be taking those ideas into the election campaign. They're gonna be putting the candidates of other parties on the spot saying, well, look here, where do you start? They're saying this program calls for, you know, public housing, so, um, in, you know, increased uh, uh, spending on education, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you stand on this? Where do you stand on solar power? Where do you stand on the hours, you know, the, the number of hours in the workday? What's your position about what the minimum wage should be? What do you have to say about LGBTQ rights? You know, if people uh, embrace that overall positive program, of this is what we want going forward. If they embrace it strongly enough that they're going to then turn around and, and you know, demand that all the parties running in the election, you know, make clear where they stand on those particular issues. That's how we're going to influence the outcome of the election. Um, I, I have to follow up that with that three and four candidates here, because I've got to ask, will you be putting your name forward on a ballot in uh, the 2023 election? Oh, it, quite likely. Do you, I mean, know, I do you know which riding you would be looking at or have, are you willing to announce here on the show an exclusive <laughs> scoop, which riding you'd be running in? Um, no, actually, because it's, you know, it's not just my choice. I mean, that that's, we're a democratic party. We make those decisions by, you know, we have discussions and make decisions collectively about who will be the candidates and where they run. But, you know, just from a practical point, point of view, it's, it's um, you know, where we have our organizational strength, it's going to be in Edmonton and Calgary. And it'll be in, you know, the more working class ridings. And it, it might be me. It is my, it's actually my uh, intention that it's not going to be me very many times longer that, you know, that uh, new, new party members are going to, um, you know, come along and, you know, they're going to be practicing in between elections in this way I've described. They're going to be developing their leadership skills and their public speaking skills. And there's going to be a whole new generation of uh, candidates stepping forward, uh, you know, and I hope that that's going to happen sooner rather than later. I'm going to be, I'm going to feel that I've, that my work has not been in vain when I can decide that I'm not running in this election. <laughs> um, Naomi, I have one last question for you and then we'll do our official wrap up here. And that is, how can people learn more? We've talked for the last 50 minutes on uh, a lot of issues, but I feel like we could probably have just scratched the surface on things that are going on in the world of politics, but also your party. How can people reach out to you, get involved, learn a little bit more, and also contact you if they have questions? Okay, well, you can go to our website, which is communistpartyalberta.ca. That's communistparty-alberta.ca. You, one of the tabs there on that web, website is um, our provincial election platform from, from the last election. And you know our, our platform will change, but it won't change hugely because the same overall strategy will be in it. So they'll be able to see there our thinking about elections and about other things. I would also advocate that they, go, that they visit the Communist Party of Canada website because we are in fact an intrinsic part of the, the Communist Party of Canada. Our policies are, you know, um, focused and specialized for Alberta, but they don't contradict that of the, the party as a whole. And uh, it's the Communist Party of Canada has a, a actually a more active website with a lot more current day to day uh, postings. And, and your your email address or contact information is on that website as well. The Communist Party yes. hyphen Alberta. Yes, it is. And uh, or they can even just. Uh, contact us at communist party hyphen Alberta uh, at shaw.ca. I certainly will. For anyone who's ever listened to the show or watched the show, you know what I'm about to say. Th those links are in the show notes. So scroll down. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's the links. Click it. You can contact uh, Naomi if you wish. Um, also, if you're listening to this on your car stereo, please turn to, to uh, pull over before you do, but go back on your phone and you can look through these show notes and there will be all the contact information. Um, Naomi, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This is uh, being enlightening and I'm always happy to talk to people who like talking about politics, but also have people like yourself on the show. So thank you so much. 
Well, my pleasure. Thank you. I yeah. really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, guys, keep talking.